You are tuned in to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. Join us now on another exciting metaphysical journey. Relax, tune in, drop out, and take a seat by the fire as we explore new realms and possibilities. This is Magenta Pixie. You can find me at magentapixie.weebly.com. But now, here is Zany Mystic and guest. Enjoy the show. Greetings, and welcome to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. I'm your host, Lance White. Tonight, I'm thrilled to have a couple of good friends on the show, and they are Anelia Benz and Larry Bazell. Uh, most of you are very familiar with Anelia from her work on Ascension 101, the website, and uh, the other website, Walk With Me Now, on raising the vibration of the planet. Um, when I first saw the video that she did, uh, the first video she did explaining that she had never incarnated in any other planet prior to this, I was just fascinated by the two-hour interview, and uh, I felt that we were destined to have some contact, and I needed to have her on the show. So she's been on the show many times, and she's a wonderful person and became a personal friend, as did Larry Bazell. Uh, oddly enough, Anelia lived in Sacramento, which was about 45 minutes from where I live. So I got to go to a number of her wonderful events and three-day, uh, med- two-day meditations and, and so on. And she has been raising the vibration of the planet and uh, taking an act of force, uh, an act of stance, because Source asked her to uh, to do that in 2010, I think. And um, so she's since then, she's also written a couple of books. And one of them, is, they're both fascinating books, uh, but she just came out with a new one. And her first book was called Interview with an Alien. And her recent book, which just came out, and it's a terrific, uh, exciting book called Interview with a Psychic Assassin. And there's a lot of truth embedded into the uh, fiction. And it's a wonderful book, so uh, be sure to check that out. You can uh, check out her site, walkwithmenow.com or ascension101.com. And Larry has uh, been working with Anelia for a long time, since as long as I've known uh, both of them, I guess, on helping with uh, establishing venues and... He uh, lived in uh, Nia Bay and uh, as, is part of the Macaw tribe. I, I call him a shamanic wisdom teacher because he tells the most fascinating stories. And he's like an ancient, uh, he's young, but he's like an ancient storyteller. You know, when the tribes used to sit and tell stories, and that's what they had. They didn't have television and cell phones. Uh, oh, my, that's a, a world that we can hardly imagine. Uh, but... Uh, they shared wisdom and uh, power and strength through sharing stories, and it's an incredible uh, tribe up there, the Macaws. They're, it's a fascinating people. They were whale hunters, and so uh, Larry has had a lot of experience on the sea, and now as uh, one of his uh, jobs is to run his boat and uh, to fish, to become a fisherman. So. Uh, I know that a couple thousand years ago there was a fisherman <laughs> that was became very popular that people still talk about. So it's a noble, it's a noble uh, uh, way to earn a living and to uh, feed people. So uh, I'm going to stop talking and just bring them on the show because we want to find out what's been going on. Uh, we haven't had Anelia on the show for a while, so let's welcome. Anelia Benz and Larry Bazell to the show right now. Hi, guys. How are you? Hi, Lance. Hi, Lance. Great to hear your voice. <laughs> you too. So, um, you uh, recently, um, you both uh, entered into a relationship and got, ended up buying a boat, and you're living on the boat now in Nia Bay. Is that correct? Yes. 
<laughs> yes, we are. Okay, I see this is going to be a yes and no uh, question <laughs> and answer series. Um, how old are you? In the, no, we're actually on the kidding. boat right this minute, and we just had our first rain squall in Nia Bay in the last, I think, month, and it's been, uh, this is the first time I can remember it not raining for this long in a row, but we got a good squall. And uh, our new yacht has a few spots that need a little bit of attention, and one of them leaked into Brett's room. So we were oh. getting a little, hey, it's leaking in my room news. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were talking. <laughs> it's like, it's all right. You're on a boat. That happens. <laughs> so how long ago did you uh, move up there? Because I remember when you had the boat pulled out to have it, uh, what do you call it? Um, the boat had to be, you know, repaired fixed. and fixed. It's dry dock. <laughs> Dry dock. Dry dock. Yeah. yeah. Dry dock. And um, what? So, how long have you been up there? It seems like just yesterday that you know you were leaving Sacramento, and I was really thinking, you know, oh my God, she's not going to be in Sacramento anymore, and I won't get to see her, and no more events, and blah blah blah. And uh, and the next thing I know, you're doing the boat. And so, how long ago was that? And what's it like? And tell us. Tell us everything that uh, you want to share to catch us all up on what's been going on. Yeah, we moved together in September, October, totally. October. And um, um, the first thing we did was to go to Europe. So we, we spent a month and a half or two months, is it? Two months almost. Two months. Yeah, almost two months in Europe. Just the two of us. We did a, some events there. And we traveled different countries and did a lot of energy and mystical work while we were there, too. And then um, then we came back and it was a matter of uh, fitting back in where we were going to live and all these things, not really knowing where we were going to live. I knew I couldn't live in Sacramento anymore because of the air. I couldn't breathe down there. Plus, I love the sea and here is right next to the sea. So we decided to try up here. So we got this, um, I live, live aboard um, and we basically live in the water. Hmm. Uh, that was pretty interesting how how that came to be, the the living on a boat thing, um, mm. <laughs> because I had I had been looking for a place to live uh, since I separated and divorced from my ex-wife. I've been kind of drifting around, lived in a little RV with no electricity and no toilet, kind of looking for a right place to be. I lived on my fishing boat for a little while, but that's not very fun, you know, living on a boat that you work on. Right. Um, here and there and everywhere, and when we got back from Europe, we didn't have any idea where to live. We were living in a in uh, cabins and in, in hotels, looking for a place to rent or looking for a house, looking for something on the land, you know, a place to mm. have your own bed and your own right. laundry and things like that, right? Like everyone mm. wants. And it would not happen. I mean, people, you know, if you ha you ha we had saved up money for rent, so we had six months of rent saved up, and we would try to call somebody and go look at the place and tell them, yeah, we'll take it. And we have six months rent to pay in advance. And we'd never hear back. No call, huh. nothing. Wow. We call them a week later, and they say, oh, yeah, we got busy. I'm sorry. Uh, let me call you right back. i got to talk to my husband. Nothing. I mean, this mm. happened over and over again. Uh, I think one uh, one afternoon we were sitting there wondering why we have such a hard time manifesting a place to live. <laughs> and my um, my new stepmom, she said, have you guys thought about living on a boat? And I kind of laughed because I'd always dreamed of living on a liveaboard boat, not a fishing boat, but a real boat, real boat with a real shower and a toilet and all the normal things, you know, a nice place like that on a boat, on the water. Mm. And so I laughed, and she said, Vanilia said, well, would you live on a boat? I said, are you kidding me? She <laughs> thought I meant no way. <laughs> like, of course I would. I always dreamt of living on a boat, and she also always dreamt of living on a boat. And it was... Uh, it was then I said, probably, I think I can find us a place to live on a boat in about five minutes. And within wow. four minutes, I found the boat that we're living on. Wow. <laughs> it was that fast. Well, well, isn't that how it works when you're in alignment with your own, uh, your <laughs> own spirit? And, you know, life just kind of reveals by the, way, the directions that it goes, you know, this is a no direction. This is a no direction. Is you know we're not getting anywhere this way. And bing, 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 bing. You won the no, jackpot. We're very stubborn, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've been here long enough, many times enough, to know how stubbornness gets you some stuff once in a while. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a little hard to move from stubborn to ease. And mm -hmm. uh, 
um, what is perseverance and what is ease, you know? We have a lot of words to describe uh, work hard and you get. But we don't have a lot of words to describe um, it comes with ease when it's in alignment. We don't really have a lot. Mm -hmm. So I worked, I worked really, really hard to find a place to live, trust me. And so did Anelia. We looked and looked and looked and looked. Well, Actually, I looked and looked yes. and looked and looked. <laughs> I kept saying, we're obviously not looking for the right thing because if we had, we'd have it by now. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so I'm a little stubborn. <laughs> like, well, okay, that'll get worn this? away fast. <laughs> Living with Amelia. <laughs> yeah, well, it was clear and obvious the minute we both agreed on the same dream and we're mm -hmm. aware of we had the same dream it was minutes minutes and it was right there top of the list that's it right there and both of us saw it instantly said yes that's absolutely it and then when we went to go buy it the guy had already sold it to somebody and said well I don't know I told him I'd sell it to him if he doesn't show up in the next week with the money you can have it I guess uh. <laughs> and he never showed up Wow yeah. Wow. And then you had it in dry dock. To, yeah, um, we put it in dry dock and we fixed some, some bits and some pieces of it to make it uh, good and seaworthy and beautiful and all that. We didn't really want to go into debt to buy a boat. And um, again, one of my limitations around that is it it shouldn't cost very much if I'm not going to go in debt to buy it. You remember mm -hmm. the story with uh, the free the free truck. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I got a free, free, free truck, but I had to go through a story to get it, right? Yeah. So it was a little same with the boat. In order to get a, a boat that we could afford and not have to go into debt to buy, it needed some repairs. Well, you're just uh, a magician. Both of you are magicians, really. I, I'm <laughs> all constantly amazed. Um, Larry took me on a trip up to Nia Bay. I guess a year or two ago, uh, we were going to do an inter. We did an interview with uh, what was her name? Um, <laughs> do you remember Larry? Uh, oh, over at Washington, the interview we did. Larry, do you remember the name? Well, anyway, I was going up, Larry, to. Oh, hold on! We interview. have a little bit of an emergency. One of our cats fell in the water. <laughs> Oh, one of your cats fell in the water? Oh, she's out in the water. It's fine. Oh, okay. She's just wet and smelly. <laughs> That's her third trip to the sea, by the way. She <laughs> fell in the water twice in one day. Tell them to give her a bath. Oh, they're practicing for the end time. <laughs> she, fell, she fell in the water twice in one day and couldn't get out the first time. The second time, she just got up wet, so she managed to figure out how to get out. And this time is no different. She's, uh, I think, part mermaid cat. <laughs> oh. But okay. yeah, I remember when you came up to Nia Bay, you were the first one of our group. <laughs> yes. And, and you and got so to see everything. Larry showed me everything. We stayed at his mom's house, and and oh boy, the stories, that, I mean, it was such a rich experience uh, being there. I am forever grateful Do you for remember all of too? the things the, uh, you know, that we the did. And, here, how we managed to create an extra day or two. Yeah. Um, just amazing and magic, and I sensed that there were spirits everywhere. I mean, <clears throat> on our way back through the forest after we went down to the beach, I actually climbed down on a rope. <laughs> and um, <laughs> was so it, that, that was good for quite a few laughs. <laughs> and uh, then uh, the we were coming back, and it was dark to this mysterious forest that was dead. And I oh. was I was sensing all kinds of strange creatures you know, invisible creatures. Um, but to get back to uh, your dream, and yeah. now why do you think it is that it takes so long for us to to uh, cycle through all of the things that we think we're supposed to be doing to get to where we to, to our dreams? I mean, are they that deeply buried that we have to just try everything that doesn't work until... Um, you know, our our guides or whatever, our higher self, source or whatever, uh, shows us that, you know, well, this was your dream. Here, this is it. Why does it take well, so long? Well, we carry a lot of assumptions, you know. In my dream to live on a boat, I would have 
I assumed that Anelia wouldn't even dream of wanting to live on a boat because of what oh. I saw. The evidence that I saw with my five senses said, no way would she want to live on a boat. Mm -hmm. Because of where I had met her and how I had seen her, what she'd been doing when I met her, and you know, the things like that. We, um, we make a lot of assumptions based on what we see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we don't know any other reality than the one we see, most mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. So our assumptions are all based on what we have as evidence of truth, you know? Mm -hmm. So we are, we're willing to stretch our truth meter past the things that we see, but at the same time, we make our decisions day to day based on what we can see. So that's probably mostly what gets in the way. As what gets in the way of uh, realizing most of your dreams is uh, a boat that I don't have to go into debt for, you know, has mm -hmm. to be broken. Right. So it's not right. very expensive. That'd be a good example, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't understand why we had to go through that story, but now that I've been with Larry for and well, it's quite a long time now, <laughs> nearly a year, no, not quite, but it's October, yeah, nearly, we're getting there. Um, I can see that he needed a story that would fit into his reality, Yeah, because mm -hmm. I can, for my, my story would mean, you know, we get a brand new... Uh, completely free, <laughs> right? nice boat, you know, that would be part of my reality, but it wasn't his, and it, we're creating, co-creating something. And also, um, he knew about boats, so he had the authority, and it was the search, you know, he said, I'll find us, I'll find us a boat within five minutes. Boats I know how to find, right? Mm -hmm. But all those... We're all inside a matrix that said the boats you can find are inexpensive because they're broken, they need to, to be looked after, taken care of and stuff. Yeah, we manifested the amounts of monies and everything else we needed to fix it, so we're still debt-free with regards to the boat. Um, but um, it had a long story and um, time fixing it, time in dry dock and all sorts of things. <laughs> I kept looking around thinking... What am I doing here? <laughs> yeah, so, this round is like weird. What are we doing this again? <laughs> this, this, this. And he kept saying, but this is how it goes. And this is why exactly? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <clears throat> you both had um, some pretty mystical experiences while you've been up there too. And, and uh, again, it seems like that's an area where there is more um, space for the ancestors and the ancient uh, ancient ones to to be there. It's it's just there's just such a different feeling of the energy up there, and people in cities and uh, even those that live out in the country might have a hard time imagining how utterly metaphysical and mystical and spiritual and dangerous as some of those spirits can be that live. Uh, you know, in areas that are are considered sacred, sacred portals. Um, you both had an experience not too long ago, didn't you, where you uh, had uh, some unusual occurrences? That's right, yeah, and it was um, the 3rd of July, it was, we went on a hike. I wanted to get out of the town because uh, near Bay here, this is the reservation here, it gets really full of people for the 4th of July. So the place was packed, you know, it's like full, full of people everywhere, like the RVs and camping and fireworks, fireworks oh. every second. And oh my gosh, there were people everywhere. So um, Larry asked me if I wanted to go for a hike and says, yeah, well, I want to go up a mountain somewhere. Just go up in altitude because when there's a lot of people at a certain um, geographical level, if you go up from that level, you sometimes... Uh, lose their field to have a little bit of peace and quiet. So we were driving for a while, and um, and then we came to, and it was like, no, can we go a bit higher? Can we go a bit higher? And eventually we came to this an abandoned, um, well, blocked off road, wasn't it? Yeah, it was fenced off. It looked like it was impassable. It has one of those logging road lock gates. I don't know if anybody's seen those or not, but they're like massive, massive, two foot thick steel beams with uh, this lock that you cannot. You can't cut the lock, you can't shoot the lock, you can't pry the lock off. If you don't have the right key, there's no way you're getting through there. I mean, with a big, huge torch on the back of a truck and a grinder, you still can't get through. With a bulldozer, wow. you still couldn't push it over. It's hard. And so we got to that gate, and I said, well, I guess we're not going further than here. 
But I had a little message in my head. It said, oh, it's not locked. <laughs> it just looks <laughs> like it. So I said, oh, okay, I'll go look. I went out and looked, and sure enough, the it wasn't locked. You just pulled a pin, and the thing opened up. Huh. So I opened up, and we went back up, way up, way back into the into the end of the road. The road actually made a loop, and it had a landslide at one point. And so it got closed off, and it doesn't loop around anymore. So I wanted to drive up to the landslide, and then we'd walk past there, and I'd be as high as I felt we could probably go. For some reason this time, there was no landslide, and there was no block. The road just went and went and went and went. Mm. Very strange. We were driving for ages. Wow. And then we, we see this, this sea among the trees, and um, Larry stops the car and says, let's go and have a look in the sea. And I said, um, there's a cliff there, isn't there? He says, yeah. And I said, I'm not getting out of the car, because what I saw was our dog, Missy, falling down the cliff. And I thought, I don't, I'm not going to risk it, so I'm staying in the car. So he got gets back in the car and we, we continue driving. <laughs> yeah. we, went, we went even further and, you know, this is like way past the end of the road already. It should have already stopped a long time ago, but it didn't. And I'm going wondering what is going on. Well, it'll be obvious when I get to wherever I'm going because that seems to be the nature of things. So I'll just go with whatever happens. And as I'm going along, all of a sudden I see these rock pools. They look like, um, you know, the... Pools in Hawaii, you see, where people are lounging in the rock pools, you know? They're like mm. solid rock, but they're scooped out, kind of. Uh-huh. They looked like those kind of rock pools, so I stopped. I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. I've never seen that before. And then the whole road by the side of the road, going down into it on both sides, was totally trampled down, like a uh, herd of elk had gone through it or something, you know? So that was enough for me. We stopped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Missy gets out of the car. That's a dog, and uh, we were we were traveling with three little kitties. My my little nine year old boy, and two um, of Larry's uh, a niece and nephew that of Larry's, and um, they all ran out of the car. And the edge of the road that was going downhill was actually another huge cliff, <laughs> massive. And of Ooh. course, the dog runs right into it and down, and she falls down. And I thought, oh my gosh. I mean, I looked down and I thought, she's dead, you know, as she, as she was falling through the air. <laughs> You've seen those cliffs, Lance. There are cliffs around here are big. That was like oh, a 60, yeah. 70 foot cliff. It was a long ways down. That was a long and way. She, yeah, she just walked up to the edge and started whining, 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 and all of a sudden she's gone. She's gone. Ooh. Yeah, but I all the little it. kids are running for the same edge. Yeah. Wow. So we stopped the kids getting there. So we send the kids back. And we looked down, and Missy was fine. She was just looking up at us. Just way the heck down there, a tiny little dot. Tiny little dot looking up at us. Huh. <laughs> like, oh, my God, how are we going to get her up? Yeah, yeah, that was her next problem. She's alive, but how do we get her back? <laughs> <laughs> so Larry and the kids run to the other side of the road where the stream and the, a little waterfall was there, and thinking maybe there's a way in through the bottom of the road or something. I don't know culvert. what they were thinking. There's a culvert that runs under. Yeah, so they ran up there and I go behind them and I think, I can't go there. And there was like a, a no-go sign. I could see it very clearly. No, don't go there. And I knew that if I went, there would be trouble. But they were okay because they couldn't even see it. So I go back to the car and I close my eyes and say, Missy, come home. And I really felt her, you know. I really felt Missy like a dog. Mm. I wanted her to be home. And I don't know why I said home, but it felt like with me, right? And I opened my eyes, it was like a split second, I closed my eyes, said I opened my eyes, and she was sitting right in front of me. I have no idea how she made it back. Oh. It's impossible. It was like physically impossible. And then I go, oh, okay, and she's looking at me, and she's looking at Larry and the kids, and says, go, go ahead, go, go with them, and so she runs after them, right? <laughs> yeah. So the kids and I, now that Missy's fine, we start heading up these pools to explore them, and each one is like, it's like... Um, like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, you know, each corner, you look around the corner and there's, oh my God, look at that. But uh-huh. each one of them is a little bit harder than the one before to get through. So like, a, like, I think the kids really like video games and it was just like video games. Where wow. each level was a little bit harder. Uh-huh. The rocks were oh, slipperier yeah. and they had to go navigate this log and then you had to grab this rope, maybe swing mm-hmm. around this thing. It's like a video game. But each time we get past one, you couldn't resist but go a little further and find something else. And every time we'd go somewhere else, it'd be something else fantastic. Like there was an amphitheater made out of rock uh, rock and trees and actually cut into the rocks. And wow. on the face of that rock wall was all these um, like druid faces in the, in the rocks. You could see the eyes and the nose and the mouths. And it was just 
incredible, you know, that kind of thing. One after the other after the other. But every of the little holes, you remember the little holes that you looked into, Lance? Yeah, yeah. So, oh, that's a fairy hole or whatever would be in there? Yeah. All of these holes had a cloud of um, teeny little eensy beensy bugs in it. So you look in there and you want to go look into it, but you'd, all you'd see is these horrible bugs and they go, ew, you wouldn't want to look and so you'd like go away. Uh, and you know how things are. When you say don't look, that means, well, I want to look now. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, in the meantime, I was, um, I decided I was going to go up the road by myself because that's, that was okay to go on the road. And I was walking quite a long ways, and then I realized it was a really bad idea to separate. When you're in the wilderness, you do not want to separate from the group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I turned around, and then this bug, it was like a fly. I could, sometimes it would be a fly, sometimes it would be a bee, mm -hmm. and sometimes it would be like a flying spider or something. It kept going around my head over and over again, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this is not, this is weird, you know, what, it, what are you? And suddenly... I could sense and feel and see with my inner eye, you know, like your mind's eye, this um, shaman, because on the way up, on the side of the road, I, I clearly saw some people, they were like men with long beards and hair, like dark hair, but really white skin that was adorned, and they had weapons, and they kept following the car up this road, right? Uh -huh. And when we got there, they kind of vanished into the woods, but um, I, could, I could feel one next to me, and he said... Um, You've got to leave here, and we're taking one of the kids because you've uh, violated our space, and all sorts of stuff like that. You know, like this message is like really angry, really upset. We've gone into the kids, Larry and the kids have gone into a portal, sacred portal of theirs, without permission, without asking or anything. They just trampled everywhere and whatnot, making noise and all sorts of things. And I said, um, Well, you can't take one of the kids because they're, they don't know about these things, you know. Uh, they're mine anyway, because I'm the adult, so you can't, I don't, you don't have my agreement. So he says, well, they're with an, another adult, and he's there, so he's agreeing, <laughs> <laughs> and all these things. So it's like, and, and they would show me pictures of Brett falling into one of these holes that had no bottom, and they would take him down, and all sorts of things, and then a bear, uh, oh, and then, um, and I said, well, can you have leniency, because Larry doesn't know any of these things, you know, he hasn't been trained, so how could he possibly know the etiquette of how all this how this works so um he went away and came back and says you get them out of there and you escort them out yourself or, or i'm sending a bear to get one of the kids oh my god i know and i thought okay all right you know so i sent larry a really strong message there's a bear coming get out of there right away bring the kids get back in the car and um and i texted him at the same time where are you right and he texts us back immediately saying, we're on our way back. <laughs> <laughs> As I was walking back to the car, this was, I mean, I had gone quite far. And then uh, get in the car and the road is super narrow and there's uh, ditches on both sides. And one of the sides is not a ditch, it's like a massive cliff. So they showed me where to turn around. I had to drive quite a bit up the road, turn around, and then I came back down. So the car was ready to go when the, the, they all arrived. But when I actually got to the car, and all the way up the road, and all the way down, the car was covered like a, a massive cloud of mosquitoes and um, flies. Mm. But it, when I would open the door, none of them would go in, right? not into the car, just outside. Huh. And um, yeah, it was really weird. And I waited for a little while, and then the dog arrived, and the oldest of the nephew arrived, and the niece, and then Larry and Brett uh, arrived, and Brett was limping really badly and was completely soaked from from chest to bottom, yeah. like completely soaked. He fell in one of the holes. He fell into one of the holes and um, so I told them all to get in the car, we were leaving and oh, part of the deal was that this shaman guy was coming with us so we, we went uh, all the way down and then once we got to the village it was fine, we were, we were I had escorted them out as agreed and we dropped the kids off at uh, the other house. Uh, then we came to Ilaria, our, our liveaboard boat. And we were talking and I told Larry my side of the story. And he was amazed because he was saying, he told me his side of the story and it was like completely matched, you know? Yeah, we, had, we were walking up and we felt, oh man, there's a bear around here, guys. Huh. So what do we do? We all grab sticks and we say, well, if the bear comes around, we'll just whack him in the nose. Who is there? Nine-year-olds and ten-year-olds. <laughs> sure, a bear. We'll just whack him in the nose. No problem. <laughs> and 
And uh, huh. we had a black fly um, buzzing around my head for a long time. It kept buzzing around, buzzing around, chasing me around like a wasp. If you get a wasp on you, you know, and it chases you no matter what you do. Uh-huh. They run over this end and it'll follow you. For like 10 minutes, this black fly is doing that. And I'm pretty sure it was a bee, and then it would be a fly. And then when I looked again, it would be a beetle with the little hard shell wings stick up. You know how mm. beetles look when mm-hmm. they're flying? Mm-hmm. It was like way past the amount of time that that thing could possibly want to follow me. And then I realized, oh, wait a minute. That's not a bee or a wasp or a fly or a beetle. That's a something else. But I can only see it the way I can see. And that's what I can see is a beetle, a wasp, or a fly. Mm-hmm. And it was funny because when I saw it, for what it was, instead of what it looked like, when I could really see it, it stopped um, trying to harass me. It wasn't able to anymore. Because, mm. you know, what are you going to do with a, a fly? You wave it off and hope it goes away. But with uh, an elemental or something else, a program or a, a little fairy or whatever, you know, a thing, mm-hmm. a person's bugging you and you look at it, they are seen, you know, they don't have the same... Uh, anonymous permission to, uh, I guess, engage. I think it changed the agreement. Anyway, it stopped. <laughs> hmm. It moved on to one of the kids. <laughs> and they were saying, what is this thing? It keeps landing in my hair. <laughs> it was crazy, that thing. And that, that it was working on Anilia, too. It was pretty amazing. Because it was obviously something not what it looked like. After a while. And I got the, you know how it is if a wasp is chasing you and you get scared like it's going to get in your hair, crawl down your collar, your shirt, things like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if you just stand still, the bug's not going to sting you and all of that, but it's still time. You have this terror built up. It was projecting that terror. Mm-hmm. And that would make you, uh, in the woods that we were in and where we were at, if you got terror, mm-hmm. you would act a little bit like, uh, you know, you would slip and fall and break your leg for sure. Yeah, I think that was part of it. I think that's why we got out of there quite safely because um, even though I don't really like bugs, I wasn't, I never felt any fear or anything. It was just bugging me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there was never any agreement. I never had any doubt that the kids would get out alive because they're all little powerful little psychic shamanic babies anyways and none of them had agreed to leave that day and die or anything um and um plus the 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 whole thing it almost felt like a test almost you know Mm. if you fall into fear yeah you're gonna get hurt but if you don't then somehow you're you're worthy you know and since then it's like it's almost like um these guys have become they're actually really loving loving and supportive and really nice to hang around they hang they come over and when they visit they they sit really really close to you and they'll hug you you know mm-hmm. and they'll kiss the top of your head because that's what they do with each other when they say hi and it's like really really loving and they share information and they they really want to co-create and i think a comment that larry made a few days ago that our paradigm is shifting, and that doesn't just mean as humans, but their paradigm is also shifting, and it's for them also to expand their world and their awareness. I think that's quite accurate. Mm-hmm. What, uh, if you had to describe what you would, how you would label them for people to understand, what would you call them? Well, Larry said, call them uh, elemental shamans, and uh, I think it's really accurate, even yeah. though mm-hmm. half of them have that shamanic um, energy and disposition, and the other half, at least of the ones that we saw, were warrior-likes. The mm-hmm. first ones that I saw on the side of the, war- uh, the road were definitely warriors. And mm-hmm. when we had the one come with us, and he wanted to go back, and I kind of projected the way he could go back, but he didn't want to. Eventually, it got, he managed to communicate that he wanted others to come with him. And when we got there, like most of them were shamans that first appeared, but then all this bunch of warriors arrived. Mm-hmm. And oh. they asked Larry permission to, to come as well. And they came with us. But it's very oh. much uh, the shamanic elementals would be, because I suppose we 
engage more with the shamanic side. The warriors are very independent and go off and do their own thing. But mm. in their role, it's almost like what we think of the human roles as male and female for them would be shaman and warrior. And they change roles depending on their interests throughout their life. They don't have to get stuck with one, so they can do either or, or both. And um, their personalities are very, very different one from the other. Wow. Well, you know, <clears throat> that makes me wonder with our, uh, in the world that we live in, <clears throat> if we, you know, we probably have trampled over so many sacred portals all over the globe and, you know, been warned and the bad things have happened and people wonder why that happens. But we become pretty much uh, unconscious about the, these subtle elements and, uh, we're the interlopers or the intruders in so many areas, and but we've run them out because we've just literally uh, bulldozed our way through uh, without uh, having an awareness of these things. And I really appreciate people who are are involved with the shamanic uh, path and and the metaphysical path because we're encouraging a reconnection to the subtle elements and the subtle energies that we have. And it can open some doors for us to experience other things like you did. And you, but you and Nelia have, have stories as, for the, you can tell all night about metaphysical things. As fascinated as we were with, and you are with the, the thought of their subtle world, they were equally, if not doubly fascinated with what was going on here. Oh, okay. We're right everywhere in town, top to bottom, edge to edge, everywhere. And they all wow. bailed off at different times to go check it out. It was, it was just like going into the most beautiful, amazing, natural place you could ever imagine. They were in heaven. It's like wow, a place they could cool. get. So, well, from their perspective, you know, getting a ride out of there to go check out a whole new. Paradigm. Oh yeah, yeah. They got, I mean, it was like, they got out of their little portal and came down. And you got a ride somewhere or something, you know? Yeah, how nice. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, have you guys been sensing anything about what's going on uh, energetically in the world? I know, and uh, people used to kind of uh, look to you for, uh, oh, just foreshadowing things as far as what the collective was up to. And both of you are so in, are so tuned in, and, and so uh, connected to everything that um, I'm sure a lot of people will be wondering, what are you sensing uh, about the shifts, uh, the shift, whatever you want to call it, and the energies, and where we're headed? Because it does seem that things are becoming more um, obvious in duality. Yes. Well, yeah, I think that the duality is being accentuated and also there's a lot of investment in trying to make the disaster part really powerful. Um, we left the Wi-Fi on the other day and I had this massive dream about a tsunami in Hawaii, <laughs> somewhere like uh -huh. in Hawaii. And it was like really powerful and it went on and on and on and on and on and on. And it's like that stuff is being projected so that we start agreeing with it so that it can be manifested. Because one of the things that the powers that were didn't realize some years ago, and we're talking about a couple of decades ago, was mm -hmm. that even though they had the technology and they could make the technology and they wanted to create something, they wanted to create like um, end of the world scenarios or, or eliminate billions of people from the planet and all that type of stuff. Mm. Um, they didn't factor in one of the main rules of engagements on this planet which says you have to have the person's agreement before you do anything to them. Mm -hmm. right? And human beings and human bodies don't agree to being wiped out. They just don't. So they tried everything. They've tried all their technology and it's not working so now they've figured it out and they're trying to get our agreement. So they project all these things that people, especially psychics, can sense and see, oh my gosh, it's going to be an earthquake, oh my gosh, a tsunami, oh my gosh, the society is going to crash. It's all that stuff being projected so that the more people believe it, mm -hmm. then it's an agreement and it can happen. But it's not happening because the majority of people 
miss it or don't agree with it or, th or deeply down in, in their souls or in their bodies, they don't agree with it, so it doesn't happen. However, the actual split is happening very powerfully and people are naturally um, kind of going towards and meeting with and uh, joining others that resonate with them. They're at their level of awareness that don't want any bullshit anymore, for example, Mm -hmm. But also others who do want bullshit and drama, they're getting together and then suddenly the two worlds don't quite combine very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, when a person is coming out of one and still has a leg on the other, it's really hard for them. Because one side of their lives is full of drama and hardship and everything and the other is people who are empowered and know about manifestation and everything. And uh, for example, we have that platform at Walk With Me Now and the people there, I mean, it's just bloody incredible. I mean, we had a vision, just a small group of people had a vision to set it up. And I agreed to do it as well. Like, um, I would uh, put my energy in there. But what has been coming through is so much greater than any of us have imagined. Because everybody who comes in adds to that stream of consciousness, adds to that empowerment. And is empowered and is added to and they can come in and out whenever they want. It's a complete freedom. And now, um, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, I don't really know about linear time, but I had the sense that we had to go and look at a building, uh, one of these prefabricated buildings. Larry and I went to see it, and I knew exactly which one it was. So we went to see it, and inside it's a really unusual, what one might call house, because it's not a house, it's an event house. And those, that's all we needed to know. It was an event house. So we thought, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> it's like an event house. Eventually, um, Larry received a shamanic consciousness stream, which is called the Machi, which I've had since I was seven years old. But I have personally never become a Machi. Th that's a shamanic kind of healing leader type energy streams from the Mapuche people of South America, from Chile and Argentina. Um, even though I received it when I was seven, I never actually um, activated or became a Machi myself. But I've carried it with me and certain people have received it. That the matchy just wants to get into other people because that's how they they it grows and it um empowers and becomes empowered, this consciousness. It's about people and what they know, their wisdoms and knowings. And Larry um was offered it and he received it and he has the shaman um energy and uh lineage from his mother's side. So it's like from the Maka and then all of a sudden we realized that that building was a shaman shack. <laughs> What's a shaman shack? It's a place, a building, in a location where the shaman can be found. Um, and that's inter it's interesting and important because all these shamanic lineages, all these shamanic consciousness streams, they call their own people. People are always saying the shaman, um, the shamanism or whatever, call me, I had to get on that plane, I had to go to Peru, I had to go to such and such a reservation. I had to, had to, had to. And then all the, this random person met me and says, I knew you were coming. And here it is, you know, and, and here's a present for you. And here's, it's always like that. The stories always go that way because that's the way this, these things work. And to have a shaman shack where Larry can really embody because he's really interested and he wants to, and he has been studying it and the information comes through and he really <laughs> integrates it into himself um, and st has started using it too. Um, is somewhere where others can come and get that too. And not only do they get enriched by that stream of consciousness, but they do themselves enrich it. So when they pass it along, it's doubly, triply, and everything else more enriched than it was before. You know, mm. it's like, it's super interesting. So this month at Walk With Me Now, we decided to have what's called the month of manifestation. And uh, Larry and I decided, well, what can we have that's manifested quickly, easily, and without any stories, right? No, his, no stories behind it. We said, what about the shaman shack? And he says, yeah, let's do it. Before we know it, now we have the land. I mean, we've been looking for land here that we could have for months, like months. And Larry has been looking for years, not being able to get anywhere or anything, because it's really hard to get land here in the Maca Reservation. But this family of six have instantly decided to agree to lend to lease us a piece of land that's literally in the heart of the village. Oh. Half of it 
It's very public, it's concrete and everything, and the other half is just woods and completely quiet and silent. Ooh. So it has both aspects. Beautiful. Not a place we would ever pick and look for to live. No. But mm. whenever we were looking for land, it was a looking for land to live at, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. this tiny little message, go look at this house, this blue house that you looked at before, go look at it and go inside, which was really mysterious in itself. Not mysterious, but yeah, it's pretty clear, I guess. If you say you want your message as clear as it can be, that's as clear as it can be. Go see the blue house, you know, halfway to squim. Okay, I know where that is. And then we walk in and it's, nobody would buy that house. You would never buy that house to live in. It doesn't have any place to live. It's just a big open space, basically, you know? <laughs> yeah. that oh, tiny that'd bedroom, be wonderful. Like a little, <laughs> and a little, well, a decent-sized kitchen, but the whole rest is just open. Like you would have a group meditating or playing drums or, you know, it's an event. It is an event. Yeah. So we said, oh, I get it. So the moment we start looking for an event space, a place where you would put an event house, that very moment, it appears. Well, yes. Yeah. Right, <clears throat> right. That, that's wonderful. That yeah, was ma- It was it was magic. I tell you. And oh I'm, yeah, and we we've were been here for twenty plus years looking for a place, Lance. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, as soon as we saw it, I knew that was it, and the sh- these shaman guys also agreed. Yeah. Said, yeah, this is it. This, this is, is it. Place. This is the place. Wow. And then I said, who does it belong to, though? How do we know if we can even get this? <laughs> and in that second, Larry's uncle drives by in his truck. He was sober enough to drive past. <laughs> He's been, been on a bender <laughs> because it was his birthday. And um, but he was sober and he drove, drives past and he says, um, and Larry goes up to him right away and says, do you know, whose land is this? And he says, oh, it's such and such. He says, okay, thank you, bye. And he drives off. <laughs> he didn't even know why he was on that road or why he was driving <laughs> past us or why he stopped, you know. <laughs> wow. And um, so Larry called the guy right away and... Yeah, it's like he's, yeah. Within moments, he said, "Okay, I got three people said yes in the in the last two minutes, so the other three are easy. They'll they'll agree to, no problem." And then a couple of days later, it was all all done. Sun, simple, ease, totally easy. Mm-hmm. That's a part of that manifestation. If you want to, if you really know, this is the knowing. You see, once you know something, and then you also know you don't have to have stories around them. You don't have to compromise, such as, oh, a boat that we can afford has to be broken, that's a compromise, or mm-hmm. a part of the old mm-hmm. paradigm. Once you know you don't have to do any of those things, stuff happens extremely quickly and easily, because it's within, and it's also part of that, um, what my one might call dharma or whatever, but it's like, Larry's been looking for the shaman his entire life, and it wasn't until a few months ago when I said, well, you've been looking in the wrong places, just look in the mirror, you know? <laughs> right. That right. he actually got it, you know? If you looked in the mirror, you went, oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not well, as you know, <laughs> Yeah, because you just have to watch him around his people, you know? Everybody comes to him for advice. Everybody. Even the people who rule the place come over here for it to get his advice. Not directly, wow. kind of indirectly. Um, and they call him on the phone all the time. And if anybody's sick or, or having a hard time, who do they call? It's like, Larry, you know? Yeah. He's well, never even seen it. He hasn't seen it. But, yeah, just look in the mirror. You know, that's funny because when, when I was writing the, uh, your bio, because I had to write a brand new bio and not use your old Anelia Benz one because I wanted to make sure that you and Larry were, um, it just felt like you, you needed to have your own story. And so I was starting this new bio, and I thought, well, gee, how, uh, what is their occupation? And so <laughs> I started with Larry because I thought it just felt right to begin with Larry instead. And because you've always, and you, you've been always been on the spotlight, and people flock to you and they love you and adore you, and rightfully so. But they equally love Larry when they get to know him. And um, so I thought, well, what is Larry? Well, he's a fisherman. Okay, but well, I can't put fisherman up there. You know, that doesn't, you know, people look at that, oh, he's a fisherman. Uh, so well, it came to me, and I put, he, Larry is a shamanic macaw wisdom keeper. And you're so right. <laughs> yeah, and, I, you know, I just got it. So, uh, yeah. and you're an ascension worker and author and many, 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 many other things. Many, many, many things. And the wild card. Right. 
But uh, and and both of you being just uh, wonderful and fabulous beings here on the planet, that uh, we're very fortunate to have you both. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Lance. We're going to have to write our love story soon. How all that happens. <laughs> Well, now, you know, we've got about five minutes left, and um, uh, I'm going to leave it to you guys to uh, share whatever it is that you want to share in those last five minutes, and then we'll uh, just uh, we'll wrap it up. Well, we've known each other for quite a few years, as you know, and to me, um, you and Larry were my angels, you know, it's like Lance and Larry, you know, <laughs> my two L's, my two angels. And um, I've never actually, when um, Larry would always come over and stuff, but I would never see him as a boy or a guy. He was uh, always one of the girls or like super, super nice. And not, not that guys are not nice, but <laughs> it's like a, a different connection. You know, it was a completely different connection. And then on the last visit, something shifted or changed because it was the first time I'd ever, I ever saw him as a, as a guy. And then I thought, oh my gosh, he's not only a guy, but he's really attractive. You know, uh -huh. he's super nice. <laughs> yeah. What the hell? You know, how come I didn't see this? Where, where was my, I missed the memo yeah. or something, you know? Yeah. And um, so I remember I, I spoke with you and I said, what do you think? I'm going to ask him out. What do you think? <laughs> remember uh, that, Lance? Yep, yeah, yeah. And I said, and I said I... Oh, you mean you're not going out yet? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it should have happened a long time ago. I mean, I just, I felt the connection. And it was amazing because it was like, of course, two people with a similar vibration and frequency, who else would you, who who else in the world would you be able to share your life with? I, I mean, I couldn't think of anyone other than Larry, you know, with the shamanic wisdom and the stories and, you know, the metaphysical experiences, and you both have those in common. And I thought, of course, it's a perfect match. It's it's a match, <laughs> you know, that, that was destined to happen someday. Yeah, it was so, so funny because, I mean, I'd never seen it. And nobody had even mentioned anything to me either. And then um, Daniela, that's my daughter's, uh, at the time, fiancé, um, <laughs> asked me, or asked her, asked Daniela, is Larry your mom's lover, secret lover? <laughs> <laughs> and Daniela was laughing. And she tells me this. And I was thinking, ha, ha, yeah, yeah, right. right. It's like, Larry, you're in a million yeah, years. Sure. And she says, but why not? You know? <laughs> I go, well, I don't know. And that's when I started looking differently at Larry. But one of the other things that happened that time, so whenever Larry used to come to see or visit or where there was an event, um, as soon as he left, the communication was gone, and he would go out of my mind. It's like he didn't appear, he didn't exist until there was another communication, uh, text or Facebook or something like that, or another event or another visit. He was gone out of my mind completely, he disappeared. But this time, he carried on texting all the way up to Near Bay. He's like, I had all these texts and like pictures, pictures. the whole journey back. The entire journey back, he wouldn't oh. stop. Yeah, and and car. yeah, and um, and he'd driven down in a red car, right? And then he left in a red car, and I and I couldn't figure it out. It's like this is really strange. Obviously, our conversation's not over. Our dialogue is has to continue. So I told him that, you know, what, you know, and then uh, all those other things happened. I contacted you, and then you like gave me the other bit of information and all that stuff, <laughs> and then I asked him out, you know, but. Um, Years ago, a couple of years ago, um, I was in a, an altered state of meditation and I saw this vision. I saw a vision where I was driving down a road that was full of trees on both sides and hills and mountains, very green. Um, through a, it was a really long journey. And all I could remember from it, all, all, all that happened in this vision, was that I was driving my car following a red car. <laughs> I was following a red car. And I knew that my mate was in that car. He was driving that other car. And he was taking me somewhere. I think it was his house or somewhere, his land. Mm. And I was just following him. And then we arrived to a place and he opens like a gate. He gets out of the car and I can't see his face. It's really frustrating, right? When you have those visions, can't see his face. And then, but I know I know him. And he's dark. And, and then the vision stops, you know? And I go, well, um, 
I ask, you know, the source of higher self, and when am I going to meet this guy? And he says, you're not going to meet him, you already know him. <laughs> and I go, what? <laughs> kidding me. Are you kidding me? I don't know any dark guys. Is he Latino? No. Is he black? No. Is he Asian? No. I never even thought about asking, is he Native American? <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know. Larry has, like, a little bit of blonde hair. He's actually really dark in skin. His skin is really dark. And uh, or a lot, a lot darker than any guy I've ever gone out with or married. Well, Amelia, <laughs> we're just out of time now. Oh, man, okay. <laughs> so we're going to have to have you guys back, and, and we can talk some more and have some more fun. Um, All right, cool. Thank you, Lance. Yeah, thank you, Lance. Thank you both great very much. Speaker. All the websites are up. Uh, you just check the bio, and, and they're all there. And get Anelia's new book, uh, Interview with a Psychic Assassin. Thank you guys for coming on tonight and sharing your new life with us all. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Thank you, Lance. Bye. All right. Good night.